My name is Stephen Chun, Sustainability Project Manager with Burning Man Project. I'm grateful to welcome you all to our 2021 Sustainability Report. We are hosting this call to share updates on our progress over the past two years since we've committed to our 2030 Environmental Sustainability Roadmap. Our goals are to one, sustainably manage waste, two, to be regenerative, and three, to be carbon negative by 2030. Now we know our goals are ambitious, yet they are all in line with what we all need to do to make Earth an inhabitable ecosystem. We are in a climate emergency, and we can only accomplish this if we work together and with our community. In our call today, we'll be hearing from Billy Jean, Executive Director of Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe Museum, and our Burning Man staff with updates for each of our goals. We're also really excited to share with you our most comprehensive carbon emissions inventory to date for Black Rock City 2019. Lastly, we'll be sharing ways that you can connect with Burning Man Project and the community around sustainability. We hope this call inspires you, your camps, and your communities to rally together around climate action. To make it better for the ecology of the earth for Burning Man to exist than not to. And with that, I'd like to thank you for being here. To kick off our programming, I'm gonna kick it off to Matt Sunquist, Director of Fly Ranch, to say a few words. Hey everyone, thanks for calling in today. My name is Matt. I'm out here at Fly Ranch right now. Thanks for calling in to join us today. Um, we had originally had a plan to have um, Billy Jean, the director of the Pyramid Lake Museum and Visitor Center, be able to say hello and explain a little about her work today, but she is unfortunately out of service and traveling in South Dakota right now, so won't be able to join us. So I'll just take this opportunity to put the link to the museum in here. Um, next time that you're coming out to fly or the playa or Black Rock City, we really recommend that you check out the museum. It's in uh, Nixon right off the road on your way in. And it's really beautiful and has a lot of great history and movies and books. Um, and Billie Jean has put a lot of love and thought into having that be a great center. So really recommend going there. Um, I noticed that a few folks chatted in the native land that they're on. I'll put a, a link in here to a native land map if you're curious about looking up where you are. Um, we out here for um, at Fly and for Black Rock City. We're on Numu and Niue land, Northern Paiute and Western Shoshone land out here. And so that's something that we're always thinking about uh, as we think about our relationship to land, not just now, but um, where it's been and, and whose land that we're on. Um, and that's an important part of what we're thinking about. And the museum is really a great place to, to learn more about that. So they have a, a mailing address down there. If you'd like to send a check, you can donate there and if you're in the museum, you can donate there. Um, so definitely recommend checking that out. And I, uh, Stephen, do you want me to introduce Laura or you? Yeah, go ahead. Next up, we have the fabulous Laura Day, um, who has been with us for a couple of years now and uh, has a background in working in uh, sustainable businesses, um, sustainable festival and event production and uh, is coordinating a lot of our sustainability efforts for Black Rock City itself around the roadmap. And she is a delight and a pleasure to work with. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Laura. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, for the kind words. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, like Matt said, I'm Laura Day, Associate Director of Event Operations and the Sustainability Lead for Black Rock City. And I am super excited to share with all of you a preview of all the progress we've been making in environmental sustainability. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here with you and give you a glimpse into the meaty content, or maybe in this case, veggie content, you can look forward to in the year two report. So in July of 2019, Burning Man Project committed to the 2030 Environmental Sustainability Roadmap. We've got some links for you. This document was co-written by 55 people. It took six months to write. This roadmap represents a commitment to a rather ambitious set of goals to reach in the next nine years or eight and a half, who's counting. Here are the three big goals in the roadmap. First is no matter out of place. So we wanna handle waste ecologically and avoid landfills. 
that will mean a complete shift in our consumption and disposal loops. The second is to be regenerative. By that, we mean we want to create a net positive ecological and environmental impact. Said another way, we aim for it to be better for the ecology of Earth, for Burning Man to exist than not to. Third is to be carbon negative. By that, we mean we want to remove more carbon from the environment than we put into it, cumulatively. That's all the carbon we've put into the atmosphere over the last 30 years. We want to do carbon capture and storage in ways that are legitimate, permanent, surplus, measurable, and enforceable. So last year, we published a year one report on the anniversary of publishing the 2030 roadmap and held a call a few days prior, just like this one. We were so pleased with the reception it received that we're excited about reporting every year. It's a really great way to track our progress, maintain accountability, and establish bite-sized milestones and metrics. Our year two report will be published this coming Tuesday, the second anniversary of publishing the 2030 roadmap. And now I'm gonna give you a sneak preview into some of what I find most exciting in this report. So we prefer systems that have multiple co-benefits such as waste diversion with food production. We're currently prototyping a food waste composting system at the Nevada properties using the Bakashi method, which will in turn be used to remediate soil, sequester carbon and grow food. Steven, seen here riding a barrel, has been leading the charge as you can see, making Matt and a whole lot of other folks very happy. He'll be sharing more around this project and what he's been learning and planning momentarily. DA's Mookathon is another strong example of a project with co-benefits. He picked up waste along 85 miles of the road to Black Rock City and raised $31,000. That money has been used to purchase solar trailers that will power the man in 2022. DA is gonna share more around this and the philosophy around leaving no trace in just a few minutes. So we've explored carbon capture and storage methods with five different projects and organizations. We've piloted several successful solar projects in Northern Nevada, and we're excited about scaling and expanding those. You'll hear more about some of those shortly too. Marnie's been leading a team conducting a state of the art emissions inventory, which will be published soon. This work offers a baseline for where we stand now and how we'll measure success. It also identifies where our data is incomplete and how we can continue to improve our data collection systems. She's gonna give you all kinds of awesome details in a little bit. Really excited to hear from her. This work will take the entire community's buy-in and participation. Engaging the community in a meaningful and integrated way has been both the most important element and the greatest challenge we face. A distributed open source model is the only way we will make our goals. One of the ways we've been inoculating these ideas and supporting engagement is through the Green Theme Camp community. We'll hear more about their projects with members from the Green Theme Camp community later on in the call. Much like the DPW builds streets to establish some measure of order to the chaos, we recognize the need to create a structure and platform to facilitate connection and engagement within the community. Couple that need with a pandemic and Burning Man Hive was born. Burning Man Hive has been a fantastic platform created with the intent to connect the community together around this and other initiatives through collaboration and shared learning. We utilize this platform to create a social lab process called the Sustainability Labs. This is an awesome example of community engagement that produced several projects and groups led by both seasoned and emergent leaders in the community. We're looking at next steps now to help bring these projects to fruition and bring more members of the community on board. We have seen an impressive number of people within the community stepping up and expressing passionate interest in taking on the goals in the roadmap. There are a lot of ways to get involved in this work, which is good because it's gonna take a Herculean effort to achieve. When we bought Fly Ranch, we knew this place would be keystone to how we could finally weave the sustainability story together. And then when Loggy came about, it showed a clear pathway to generate permanent sustainable infrastructure. We were amazed with the outcome of the Loggy design challenge. There were 185 proposals with more than 500 people on those teams. These were reviewed by 250 technical advisors in order to arrive at 52 shortlisted projects, which 33 jurors decided on. This resulted in over 10,000 hours of work and we haven't even started building yet. I'll give you a quick snippet into the, a few of the top designs. Ripple incorporates solutions to all five support systems of shelter, water, energy, food, and regeneration. 
to create the backbone of how the system sustains itself in an off-grid fashion with minimal inputs from beyond its borders. SEED incorporates solar, geothermal, passive cooling, composting, greenhouses, aquaponics, biodigesters, and gray water recycling. It's super exciting stuff. And the top ranked proposal to the Loggy 2020 Fly Ranch Design Challenge was Lodgers. And we are honored that this team is with us today and we'll be hearing more details from them on this project in just a bit. So I'm not gonna steal any of their thunder. Stay tuned for more. Burning Man will never be a utopia. And that's not the point. After all, shared suffering is what creates our resiliency. However, many of the projects proposed for Fly Ranch, the 360, and Gerlach will be proving a proving ground for developing closed loop regenerative systems that we can implement in Black Rock City, but also for communities everywhere. It's a sandbox to create ecologically sustainable cities and events beyond the Black Rock Desert. The projects submitted to Loggy demonstrate how much of the technology needed to solve the crime, climate crisis is within our reach. We already have much of the data and many of the tools, but what we really need is to create a regenerative culture. We happen to be experts in creating culture. And with that, I'm going to pass the virtual talking stick back to Steven to dig deeper into our compost project. Awesome, thank you for that overview, Laura. Uh, so I'm gonna go into a little bit more about our goal number one. We call our first goal, no matter out of place, which is to handle waste ecologically. Now we're focusing on the most important of the waste streams first, and that's food waste. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, states that we generate about 63 million tons of food waste in a year. This is excluding the industrial sector. Now, within this amount, 55% of it is set into landfills. Now, you might be wondering, what's the issue with putting food in, back into the earth? Well, in countries of high income, Landfills have strict regulations and are, they're required to cover disposal of materials on a daily basis for quite reasonable health and safety reasons. Now, when organic matter or materials break down in the absence of oxygen, without being properly managed, they produce methane. Methane from municipal landfills are the third leading emitter of methane gases in the United States. The EPA states that pound for pound, methane is 28 to 36 times more effective than carbon dioxide in trapping heat in the Earth's atmosphere. So what are we doing about it? Well, we've started uh, prototyping systems to divert food waste from landfills and repurpose them to remediate soil. We've already begun experimenting on Fly Ranch uh, at small gatherings, collecting this material, which we have a great photo of here. And we've been using the Bokashi fermentation method to process this material. Bokashi is a, a carbon and nitrogen mixture with effective microorganisms. What we've used here is consists of rice bran, uh, cow manure, and yeast, and a, a huge boost of microorganisms. Now what happens is that this material is closed uh, and ferments anaerobically without oxygen. In just two weeks, we can apply this material directly to the land. And so what we've done is we've dug holes and we've applied the material directly into the land. We've collected soil samples and we're excited to see, you know, the impact of this material into the land in Northern Nevada. Now, this is just a good prototype system, uh, but this summer we're planning on expanding this program to some of our year round properties in Northern Nevada. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine if we can scale this to collect food waste for Black Rock City. Right? Black Rock City has around 80,000 people. That's a lot of food waste. And what if we could collect all that material and transfer that organic matter, those nutrients and those microorganisms to create green landscapes? With this material, we can resource ecological restoration projects through reverse desertification. We can grow food in an area that's especially difficult to grow food. And we can provide healthy soil to our neighbors, to the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe, and many others in the local area. So right now, this is just a vision, and we're starting small and working our way up methodology uh, pragmatically. And if you'd like to be a part of this process, we would love more people to be engaged. We would love soil experts. Uh, we would love people who know how to grow food, uh, grow you know, native plants in the Northern Nevada area. And you can contact us at sustainability at to get further engaged. 
That's what we're doing around food waste. Next, I'd like to pass it to Dominique Tanillo, or DA, who is our Environmental Applier Restoration Manager and the creator of the boot map. DA, over to you. Hey everybody, uh, DA, your Applier Restoration Manager since 2005. Uh, I'm Pleasure to be here, and wow, this is an amazing road we're on. I'm going to share my screen right now, and uh, we're going to recap our story. It's been a couple of years or a couple of events uh, since since we've all been out on the playa together. So uh, yeah, this is uh, this is uh, our, our recap, and it's good to see everybody. Here we go. Uh, leaving no trace principle. In case you guys remember, we are committed to leaving no physical trace of our activities wherever we gather. We clean up after ourselves and endeavor wherever possible to leave such places in a better state than when we found them. Uh, so now we're going to talk about MOOP, which is a word in burner culture, which stands for matter out of place. That's right. A MOOP is anything and everything that isn't native to the immediate environment. Uh, they look at that. You know, our environment is the Black Rock Desert, aka the Playa. Uh, where there's nothing but dust. Therefore, MOOP is everything. Leave no trace. All right, and uh, remember the MOOP map. Here we go. The MOOP map, uh, red, yellow, green are the colors that we color the MOOP map. Uh, this is what Playa Restoration does when we're not, we're, we're mooping the Playa and we're assessing. And so where we're going, uh, when we're cruising fast, uh, we're moving quickly, that is green. We're go, go, go. And yellow is stop and go. It's like we're running into a little bit of trouble, but not too bad. And then red is stop, stop, hold your horses, hold up. We got, we got, we got to pick up some stuff here. So that's the red, yellow, green. And this is the very, very first MOOP map uh, from 2006. Uh, if you notice, uh, the percentages were roughly broke down to 40% green, yellow percent, uh, uh, or yellow percent, 40% yellow and 20% red. So it was basically a tie between green and yellow. Um, and then once we published this, after the next year, we went boom to 77% green and then a 14% yellow and 9% red. So really what it was, was we just needed the feedback um, and we needed to share the information. So if moving on, you'll see that there were different trends that started to happen once upon a time. Um, Esplanade used to be super moopy, uh, but then started to get better. And then so did the sound camps and then the sound camps got better. And, and then the things in the back camps uh, started to struggle a bit and then they got better and then we get to 2019 and we have our greenest MOOP map ever. Uh, so it's interesting watching all the trends happen and really is uh, shows a testament to this community. Oh, and by the way, we grew like 60,000 people in the time since that first MOOP map happened. So that was always a, a thing. It's like, what happens if we keep growing? And look, we keep growing, we get more knowledgeable and we get greener. So. Uh, just to recap where we were at with the 2019 BLM post event inspection, if you guys remember the environmental assessment report, report uh, that was like really critical of us. Meanwhile, we were undefeated in all of our inspections uh, and, and, and doing amazing work. So, uh, but it was very, this one was critical. And so just to recap, the Bureau of Land Management Site Inspection is conducted one month after the burn. The allowable MOOP standard is one square foot per acre. Say it with me, one square foot per acre. That's not a lot of MOOP. And an acre is the size of a football field. That's 43,560 square feet. And uh, so that's the equivalent of uh, 3,603 uh, acres, um, So, that, which is 3,603 football fields. Or... 156 million square feet all right 156 that's the territory that we cover and that's a lot of square feet and there's my crew the plier restoration all-star team uh, which uh, you could also be one of them and that's why uh, your cleanup effort means uh, the world to us and uh, that is us in action and that is us uh, leaving no trace and um, and assessing for the move map this is what one of the BLM test points looks like. Uh, you nail stake into the ground and tie a rope off for 30, uh, 30 feet, and then you moop everything within that circle. Uh, and this is what a test uh, point, this is what the results look like, of which we actually now have a green screen method for counting the moop uh, where we, uh, we 
measure the, the pixels, we count pixels, uh, the green pixels versus MOOP, uh, and then we figure out what that percentage is. Uh, it's much more accurate uh, than previous. And here's us collecting all the MOOP samples, and here are the results. In 2019, in case you haven't heard, Burning Man achieved an unprecedented near-perfect score. I'm going to say near-perfect score, which is almost impossible, but we achieved that in 2019 uh, when we were with all that pressure boom now we can have like fireworks and stuff and uh, so we are undefeated and unstoppable and leaving no traces not just for the playa uh look at us this is our highway cleanup uh two members of our highway cleanup team and this is our highway cleanup team in their full glory and um they hit the ground wednesday morning after exodus so once it's safe when everybody is leaving and that all that traffic that you guys are stuck in, once that's gone and it's safe for us to hit the roads, that's when we hit the roads. And we continue to patrol the highway for one month after the event. Uh, so the unsec unsecured loads are the number one cause of MOOP on the highway. This is known as road debris. This happens in every major highway all the time and it's, uh, it's a thing. So moving on, 2019 highway cleanup report, overall decrease in MOOP. Nevada Department of Transportation called our results immaculate. Moving forward, around Earth Day 2020, I got this bright idea. I decided to walk to the playa, 88-ish miles, uh, and pick up MOOP while raising funds for the 2030 Sustainability Roadmap. Uh, and thus, the DA's BlackRock Moopathon was born. Uh, and here's my small but efficient trusty crew. Uh, make sure that I didn't die out there. And right off the bat, I started off with a, this bucket, which proved insufficient, filled up very, very quickly. Uh, and then I went to a bigger bucket and uh, that also filled up quickly. And then I just moved the trash bags. Um, but this is what the highway generally kind of looked like. Uh, this is the move that some of the move that I found along the way. Um, also, it was very pretty. It was really beautiful seeing the, um, the desert highway in slow motion, but most of the time it was bottles and cans, unfortunately. Bottles and cans all day long. So in a year without Burning Man, this is the kind of move that, that shows up. Um, bottles and cans, unfortunately. And uh, Moopathon cleaned up over 2,000 pounds of Moop. And this is the home stretch right here. And Moopathon raised over $31,000 towards Burning Man Sustainability Roadmap, which I'm happy you do announce is uh, the Moopathon funds will power the Burning Man on solar in 2022 and beyond. So Solar Man is coming. Leaving No Trace was just the beginning. Leave No Trace. And thank you very much. Back to you, ladies and gentlemen. Awesome. Wow. Thank you so much for that, DA. Really exciting news. And I, I'm so impressed by the work you, you have done here. Uh, so just a reminder, we're going to be sharing a written report of our 2021 sustainability report that will have more details covering what we're looking into and what we're working on. Uh, but now we're going to pass it over to Christopher Breedlove, our Director of Civic Activation, who leads the Be Regenerative goal of our roadmap. Breedlove, over to you. Hey everybody, nice to join you today. It's awesome we got so many people in the room today. Uh, that makes me feel really excited. I, I love having lots of us working on, on all of this together because I think that's how we're gonna make it to the goals that we've set out. So we're gonna do a little section on Be Regenerative. And what we've done over the last couple of years is we've really kind of tried to let the community speak for itself in this section. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of an intro and then we're gonna go through three different community projects that are happening. So just to kick us off, I wanted to read a little piece from the roadmap about Be Regenerative, which is, Burning Man can prototype solutions that enable our species to become a more regenerative force for the planet. By the end of the next decade, we aim for it to be better for the ecology of Earth, for Burning Man to exist than to not exist. There isn't a model for regeneration, and we'll have to involve a wide scope of experts as we measure and def define this goal. And so for me, what this means, and much less how we accomplish it, is a massive undertaking. It's also subject to a wide possible interpretation, and it's gonna require a holistic and iterative process for capturing the essence of that goal we outlined above. It, it might actually be the most ambitious of the goals, though I think Carbon could probably argue with me about that, and yet it is the least defined of all of our sustainability goals. Uh, it's the point where we need to really foster a deep and meaningful dialogue about the appropriate role that the impact of humans and burners in particular on earth has 
And I think that's going to be a valuable tool and exercise just by itself. And so thinking about that, we're going to have three different speakers come in today and talk about three different levels of projects that are all working towards regenerative infrastructure at three different goals. And I hope that you're going to see throughout this that all three of these projects are interrelated, even if they're working at those goals from different levels. And so as we move into this next section, I just wanted to read this quote by Buckminster Fuller, because to me, I think this often encapsulates it the best for me, is you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you have to build a new model and that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think you're gonna see that in these three projects. So to bring up our first speaker, it's gonna be from the Green Theme Camp community that Laura mentioned a little bit before. If we think back to a year ago today, when we did the BU Regenerative section, we had someone from the Green Theme Camp community come in and invite all of you to join us. And so last October, we had the Green Theme Camp Summit, which was four days and over 15 hours of content. And that's kind of spurred this entire new movement in which we're already starting to see some really amazing offshoots happening, like the Renewables Artist Team, RAT, which just did uh, a month or so ago, a whole Solar 101 workshop for community members. So I would like to invite up Teresa Young from the Green Team Camp community to tell us what they're up to. How are you doing, Teresa? My name is Teresa. I'm a part of the Green Theme Camps community, and I'm seeing a lot of wonderful, familiar um, faces that are also part of the community in here. So nice to see you. Um, what I was going to share was a little bit about what we've got cooking, where we're headed, um, and what we've been up to. So we're basically a community of camp organizers and project leads. Uh, with the goal of really rethinking the role of theme camps in achieving the 2030 Burning Man Sustainability Roadmap. Uh, so we, it was a point really recognizing that theme camps are a backbone of the city and each one is this really beautiful whole community. Um, and the question is how do we activate and connect all of the knowledge and wisdom and resources that can help us to accelerate the transition to a sustainable burn. So with that, our mission today is to activate solutions and community towards a sustainable BRC and reach 2030 sustainability goals. Uh, since its inception in 2019, oh, great. I am seeing it shared right here. Thank you. So since its inception in 2019, we've held a quarterly summit where uh, burners with decades of professional experience and sustainability meet side by side with people who have built camps um, built the city and alongside people who are curious and committed to figuring out our role in shaping the future of BRC. So um, at this point, our community is around 150 people and growing. Uh, everyone is self-organized into different infrastructure and project groups that are active on Slack and meet a couple times a month. And we get together as a community for these quarterly roundups to highlight the overall progress, what's been made and plan around an annual summit um, for people who hopefully who are here and want to learn more there's so much room to get involved this is a really beautiful thing about it it's a total like duocracy structure like most of burners are um, lots of projects in motion um, still at very early stages and so if you're passionate about greening the burn which if you're here i'm guessing you are we'd really love to have you join and kind of help shape the vision um, with us so a little bit about um, what happens after you join well basically you get to hang out with a bunch of cool people uh, riffing on ideas, creating, inventing, um, learning, kind of leaning into the unknown. And uh, the things that we're continually asking ourselves is how might theme camps come together to share best practices? What are our collective values? How do we design the future role of theme camps to make BRC sustainable and regenerative home? And how does this go uh, beyond the trash fence, beyond quiet and into the world as models for sustainable cities? Um, definitely don't have all the answers, that's what's great, but it helps us orient in the right direction and remind us of why we're here. So how can you start? Well, any burner can start by exploring BLAST, which is Burner Leadership Achieving Sustainable Theme Camps. Um, kind of think LEAD, but for theme camps, a green theme camp certification, helping them find out how green their camp is, what does an ideal green theme camp even look like, and how do we even start to begin measuring and being accountable for this? Um, this is a super cool BLAST logo that was recently revealed that the BLAST team has been um, working on really beautifully, nicely designed, thanks VA. Uh, in addition, you can join any of the six InfraLead groups around the major infrastructure areas of power, waste, water, energy, shelter, food, and transport. So they're each led by experts and each have their own mission. 
Uh, for example, the waste group's mission is camps participating in regenerative and circular waste models, stop waste from occurring, redistribute waste to those who need it, and repurpose waste in the most regenerative ways. Lastly, um, you can contribute to the Thrival Guide, uh, which is something we're working on. It's an open source playbook for regenerative practices on Playa and beyond. Um, so there's an open form currently releasing data, ready to take submissions. We're kind of ideating on how can this look like a super easy like IKEA guide where it's like, how many people is it going to take? How long is it going to take the resources, the impact? Um, give you some cool diagrams so everyone can come in and be like, great, basic water system, great. Like, what can I do for power? How can I decrease 25% of my water usage? Um, so really try and make it easy. And uh, lastly, where are we headed? So this is the GTCC roadmap. Um, as I kind of said, we organize four quarterly virtual roundups each year. Hopefully we'll be hanging out in person soon. Um, when we weren't able to, we still were having tons of fun, brought in a DJ, threw on our costumes, had a virtual dance party. Uh, so it's not like, you know, just about, about work and we like to have fun too. Um, and, uh, you know, then we'll have last certification that happens each year, the Thrival Guide uh, publication that gets released, um, a green experimental burn, which I'll kind of talk about, but think about a place where the community can all come together and prep and prototype and build um, in preparation for the burn. And then what are we thinking beyond? So um, what you can come and dream with us is, um, like I said, the green experimental burn, TBD on this year, obviously it's not gonna happen before when the burn would typically be, but we're thinking maybe sometime in the fall, like in October, where the entire community and beyond can get together. Um, we have different working groups so we can build everything that's in the Thrival Guide. Uh, and then maybe those systems get to live somewhere that builds into something like a model theme camp where it's like a continual uh, living and learning model of a theme camp where there's in-person workshops and learning experiences um, think Green Village, you know, a central place on the playa for all green burners to come together and geek together, lots of education and learning and fun art that can be built around um, all the work that is being done. And then beyond, so a global network of sustainable and regenerative mobile infrastructure that can be deployed anywhere in the world. Uh, so ways that you can just next step, join Notion, find us on Facebook, Slack, get involved, um, come ideate with us, stream with us. Um, this is what our Notion page looks like. And um, thank you so much for the time and hope to see you all soon. Back to you, Chris. Great, thanks so much, Teresa. I mean, I think it's amazing how much work has happened in you know less than a year. And, and I know that you guys are all really willing to have as many people come and collaborate with you as possible on these goals. So I'm really excited to see where we are in another year with the Green Theme Camp community. So we just heard from Teresa about the Green Theme Camps, right? Kind of the mobile infrastructure model. What we wanna do now is kind of move into more of a land-based model. And so for the land-based model, we're going to move over to Fly Ranch and the Leggy Design Challenge. Leggy, of course, stands for the Land Art Generator Initiative, the organization we, we partnered with for this challenge. And I know, again, Laura kind of mentioned a couple of our key factors, but I do really want to kind of hammer this in again, is that with, there were 185 proposals, over 200 technical uh, advisors, 33 jurors, 500 people from those teams, 10,000 hours of time have already been put into this and the teams have just started to come out and actually see the land itself. And so to me, I just feel that a potential amount of energy and it's amazing. And what they're really prototyping, all of these 50 shortlisted and 10, 10 finalist projects are different uh, regenerative and sustainable models that can live on off-grid land projects. And so the talk about the number one rated project from the Laggy Design Challenge. I am super excited to bring up Z and Moon to talk about Lodgers. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Hello, everyone. So we are Lodgers, an off-grid land project incubated in the Land Art Generator Initiative together with the Burning Man Fly Ranch 2020 Design Challenge. We are here today to share our vision on regeneration, shelter, and community and how lodgers can contribute to the sustainability goal of Flyrange and Burning Man um, as art. 
My name is Dee. I have a background in ecological science and landscape, landscape architecture. I'm currently a graduate um, research associate at MIT. And I'm here today with my design partner, Moon, who is a computational urban and architectural designer and researcher. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here and share our project with you guys. So Moon and I met at, at MIT during our graduate studies and we clicked because we shared a very similar reflection on the contemporary city making, making process. And it is very clear to us when looking at a site like the fly, we need to come up with a radical framing that is different from the current urban ones. When conceptualizing lodgers, we kept asking ourselves, what is the dream of fly range? Whose dream is it? And what is the relationship between new and native lodgers, plants and animals, and the relationship between lodgers and the land? Last year, we spent quite some time to unpack those questions. We see lodgers as an opportunity to rethink and reframe sustainability, land stewardship, and human interactions. We respect and care about the very complex yet fragile ecosystems at fly. Therefore, we foreground the land and consider all of us as temporary guests to the land. The term lodgers refers to not only the human beings, but also the plants, animals, and structures to be built. The architectural devices will live and decay with the environment over time rather than altering it forever. In this case, lodgers will be a, med a medium to foster a kinship between humans and our, our other than human neighbors and to provide a space for cohabitation. And in, in, in order to design and build for positive environmental impact, we also took a deep dive into researching the history, material, and construction methods of the region. Fly Ranch has over 10,000 years of history of stewardship by the indigenous people. They forged and built temporary shelters with gathered natural materials through which they established a harmonious relationship with the land. So this is what we are. We honor, um, Lodgers honors and learns from the past building practice to connect the past and the future. We set out to be low tech, low energy and high community participation as our primary approach to regenerative design. Tying back to sustainability, um, our research shows that the century long wood frame construction commonly used in the US has shortened the cycle from forest to building to waste, which has led to an alarming um, increase in carbon footprint and carbon emission. In Nevada alone, only a tiny portion of the wood waste is recycled while the majority has gone to landfill. Therefore, Rogers looks into reclaimed wood material for the structure and gathered um, wild grass for the facade. We wrote a parametric design script to iterate and test the formal expression, structural stability, and buildability. So in lodgers, we combine light timber framing construction, facade thatching technique, dimensional timber recycling, and indigenous material gathering practice to build the lodgers. Essentially, lodgers will be the spaces for humans and non-human cohabitation. We can reside wherever we feel comfortable. Um, for example, the blue, the great blue heron would probably want to nest in the crown, and the arthropods would probably make home in between the facade layers. So since uh, we've started this project, um, I mean, Z and I started Lodgers, but we've actively expanded the team to include more talents for the next steps. We now have Denny um, as our lead of fabrication and John as our lead of building technology. Both of them are super awesome and they're super excited to bring lodgers into reality with us. And we also have Sheila Kennedy and Dennis uh, Piperish as our advisors. Sorry. Sheila is currently a professor at the MIT Department of Architecture and principal at the KBA Architecture in Boston. Um, Dennis is the principal at Sasaki, a renowned urban design practice based in Boston. Well, all in all, this is only the beginning of Lodgers. We nurture it and witness how it evolves in nature with the communities. And this includes everyone on this call, but who I'm sure will love and care for the future of the Lodgers. So um, with this, we want to call for people to connect with us. If you have experience in construction, 
natural, shallow, or non-invasive foundation, or you have connected location shops in Nevada or close to fly, uh, please contact us. Our email is listed here at lodgesatfly.com. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank, thank you. you. Moon and Z, thank you so much for sharing about the Lodgers Project. I find it to be so inspiring, and I hope that we can continue to get more and more energy coming towards your project, as well as to all of the other amazing laggy projects. So, right, all right, we kind of started with this mobile infrastructure model. Now we're kind of rooting in place with an off-grid land stewardship model. And now we want to move into a model about where people may already be living. So I was thinking about it when we went into this, and I realized that as this work becomes more global, everyone might not know actually where Gerlach is. So I just wanted to give a quick primer, right? Gerlach is two hours north of Reno, Nevada. Most of us know it because we pass through there on our way to Black Rock City. It's adjacent to the Black Rock Desert, but Gerlach also ha happens to be home to the land speed record, rocketry, and a whole bunch of other weird art stuff throughout time. Uh, it has around 120 people who live in it. And the sign says, as you come in, attitude good, population wanted, sometimes. So we have a lot of really amazing work happening uh, in Gerlach this year and going forward. And so I'm excited now to bring up Chef, our Senior Director of Real Estate and Burning Man Project Board member to tell us what's going on. Hey there, Chef. Hey, Breedlove. Um, thanks for that introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, another primer. Let's see how I do this. Here's Gerlach. Uh, well, you can see. Um, so the relationship with Fly and Gerlach and where it says BRS and dog, that's Black Rock Station, which is our year round facility for helping to support um, building Burning Man. Uh, most people call it the ranch, but uh, we have a few ranches now. So uh, I wanted to take you through some of the things we've been thinking about um, with uh, this summer. Um, this summer has presented a real opportunity for us instead of just um, going forward with uh, the event, it's really enabled us to dig in on um, inclusion, um, diversity and equity, also on sustainability and um, on the Loggy projects, which have been just incredible to watch. I'm based here in Gerlach, so I've had the pleasure to meet some of you and also um, have, have gone to fly to see um, some of the things that are being put together. And then also we're trying to engage um, locally um, and be a member of the community um, forwarding um, some community development outcomes um, as well as things that you might think are more normally done in um, developing countries, things like fixing the power infrastructure or um, creating broadband internet or ending food desert issues, things like that. So we call it the Gerlach Summer um, and we have our little uh, uh, logo here. Um, we're bringing the culture of um, Burning Man into um, Gerlach, Black Rock City, and beyond. So I'm going to take you quickly through that. Um, we're specifically trying to activate our properties year-round to help bring our culture, including that of Leave No Trace and sustainability and the sustainability roadmap there. Um, we also are trying to decommodify some of the participant spending that is happening now putting it in line with our values economically and in terms of sustainability and to create new revenue streams um, to support all of these efforts and the expansion. Um, inside downtown Gerlach, these are the buildings, the ones that are yellow, it means that we Burning Man Project own them. Um, the ones that have X's on it means it's closed for at least 10 months of the year. So the thing to note here is that if you live here year round and you're walking in January down the street, every other building is closed and owned by Burning Man. So we really wanted to change that and really get involved locally at creating something um, uh, sustainable and related to social justice, as well as just the things that we're creating to help Black Rock City. We also have to recognize we're the biggest actor in this town, and we have some responsibility for how we act in the town. Um, specifically, we've started up um, weekly tours to be transparent about what we're doing with every one of our properties. We also have set up a station for the summer called the Oasis. We've been building some properties in June and July in preparation for inviting volunteers from our community to come out in August and September and join on improving both our properties and also creating things um, for people to participate in. Here's the old hotel with um, the Oasis sign for it um, that we are about to put up even today. Um, and then behind the old hotel, we've set up a shade and community area for local businesses to share information, to put up local art. 
It's set up as a shade area for people just to come and commune anytime. Um, and also demonstrating what long-term we're gonna be doing here. We're in the process of designing a um, net zero building that also is carbon negative in its construction. Um, that will be done right in the center of Gerlach and also host a business incubator, um, solar power, and geothermal powering the building as well. That's currently in design. We're hoping to open it in 2023 or 2024. In addition, um, we have an old property that was a community pool that we have uh, had shut down for a while. We've renamed it Granite Point RV Park um, for the landmark that's immediately behind it in the Granite Mountains. Um, and we'll be reopening it as an RV park. There's no RV park in this area, even though we're in the National Conservation Area. 1.2 million acres of wilderness, no RV hookups, no tenting areas. So we really wanna help with local tourism um, around the year. We've been planting some trees. There are about 40 more trees that will be planted here on this property. Another 30 will be planted um, on our estate's property. So we'll plant almost hundred trees this summer alone. Um, and then finally, we're creating a year round participant work ranch as a support and launching place for green team camps for personal container storage for mutant vehicle electrification. And basically, if you think about our imprint in Black Rock City, a lot of it is in transportation to and from and in trying to figure out how to support things locally. So we are creating um, this space here called the 360 that um, will be available year round um, for people to live regeneratively and also to work on projects um, that support that overall. Um, the overall layout is uh, here's Highway 34. We have a main road, which we call Inspire Road and a main plaza. We have nowhere um, that people are welcomed in to learn about Black Rock City culture all year round. So this is gonna be that place with a little plaza and setup. We have a storage area and then also regenerative camping areas um, with uh, reclaimed wood, solar boardwalks, geothermal running through the property. And then we also have this boardwalked area that's uh, also a sculpture park that will be the destination for the county art trail. We're also making a local trail with friends of Black Rock High Rock um, to create a walking and running boardwalk year round. That's about a mile long from Gerlach all the way through the sculpture park and property and then across the street and over to Doobie Lane or Guru Road. Um, we're in process of working with the county to try to work that out. That whole thing will become a solar transmission line that will also support power generation and power distribution in this area where there is no power available. Um, so this is in process. Uh, we've just put down the heavy equipment. Um, we've graded this first road and are setting up this plaza um, right now um, today. Um, this is what it looked like two days ago. It's mostly full um, today. And we're inviting our first group on there next week. We also will be putting out a call for other people to come and visit, people that need a, a workspace. Um, we'll have shared kitchen, shaded work areas, um, uh, air conditioning, solar power, all this stuff. Um, here is the um, overall layout of this plaza that's being built um, right now. And here is our celebratory dinner um, two weeks ago in the plaza when we finished uh, grading it. Um, this is building on something that we did last summer at Fly Ranch, setting up regenerative camping, making sure we could do um, our shade structures, our trailers, the um, solar trailers that we bought, uh, making sure that they actually can be used in this way. We liked that experiment, bought six more this year and are about to buy 30 more um, that all will be used to power this 360 property um, year round. We'll also support uh, um, electrification of mutant vehicles and generally um, construction and storage and also reducing container storage. Um, we host about 280 containers here in Gerlach. We have a waiting list of five years for people to add containers. We think there are 8,000 containers in Black Rock City. So just moving those containers closer is a huge um, savings for anyone. And then finally, um, we're working on um, Black Rock Power, which is part of those 30 um, solar trailers we were talking about. DEA mentioned that between the Moopathon and um, Black Rock Power, we're funding the first unicorn, um, which will be a 32 kilowatt solar array. The first one, thanks to DEA, will have um, the Moopathon funds uh, to support creating, um, taking the man uh, off um, diesel generators. Uh, this year, we'll be building this in the next month. Um, and then after that, looking at doing a larger array. So uh, with that, I want to turn it back to Bree Love. Thank you. Amazing, Jeff. Thank you so much. I know there's so much work happening right now, and it's happening at an amazing pace. So thanks for sharing that with us and getting the whole community up to date. 
So we're kind of wrapping up this section now. Hopefully what you got to see is that there's three different levels of sustainable and regenerative infrastructure happening. And all of these three things in my mind are working together and how they're working together is actually in one of the things that ladies and gentlemen said at the very beginning is that we are entering into a time that many might be able to call a climate crisis. Just yesterday, the Guardian released an article that said for the very first time in history, the Amazon rainforest is now emitting more CO2 than it's sequestering. And so there is an, an essential moment in time right now that we're in. And I believe that all three of these projects that we just heard about are blueprints for what's gonna happen as sea levels rise, as forests burn, as people need to move. We now have three models for something that's mobile, for something that's stationary off grid and for a town that maybe wants to think about a different way of doing things. And so really this is a call for all of you to get involved with this goal. We've always known the Burning Man community can move much faster than us uh, at the organization. And so reach out to us, continue to tell us what you're doing. We know of so many projects happening this summer and beyond. I just wanted to give a quick call out to the Great Give Back, which is gonna be doing a lot of work in Nixon this year, as well as the Awfuls Gas and Snack Paiute Wetlands Restoration Day. There's gonna be more information in the year two report that we're gonna publish on that. So if you wanna get involved with either of those, those are things you can get involved with this summer in Nevada. And just a big thank you to all three of our speakers for being part of this Burning Man culture engine, because I think we know that it's not just implementing the technology of sustainability. It's really about bringing that culture of adaptation and a change of the way we see ourselves as humans and on this planet. So thanks so much. I am gonna hand it back off to Matt Sunquist, and he's gonna tell us a little bit about becoming carbon negative, our goal number three. Thanks, Breedlove. Hello, everyone. Um, I will make use of the map that Chef just shared. I am at Dog Ranch, which is uh, in the top line of his map that he was showing. Um, so just on the edge of Fly Ranch up there. Um, so next, we're going to talk a little about our goal uh, to be carbon negative. And I want to talk about a few terms there and how we talk about them. So for us, that means that we are drawing down more CO2 than we are emitting as part of our projects, as part of our gatherings. Um, and there are a number of different ways that we can do that. So we wanna take account of the, the carbon cycle, the pools, the way that CO2 goes into the atmosphere and comes back down. So there's long-term and short-term, long pools, slow pools. Um, and uh, for us, we want to try and have methods that are secure, uh, they're verifiable, um, they're measurable, um, and they have co-benefits. And so one way we think about that is we wanted to do basically be doing carbon dioxide removal. And that can come in a couple different flavors for us as we're thinking about it. Um, in a lot of ways, the, the goals that we have stack up under one another, where if we are indeed regenerative, then we have probably, then part of that would be that we are also doing this of drawing down more CO2 than we're emitting and that we are avoiding landfills, but those areas are specific and important and problematic enough that we wanted to make those specific call outs as part of our goals. So there's a, an emerging landscape of methods to be able to, to bring CO2 down from the atmosphere and to be able to store it in the kinds of long-term cycles that we need to be able to have to be able to have a viable ecosystem. The parts per million of what we have in the atmosphere now is well over 400 and the safe threshold is under 350. So in order to get to a viable ecosystem and not get to the one and a half or two degrees Celsius of change that is coming if we continue it with business as usual, we're going to need to mobilize a massive human effort to draw down this type of um, CO2. If you are looking for a collection of ways to learn about that, I highly recommend Project Drawdown's book, Drawdown. It has um, a number of different ways that you can do that. And so we've been exploring different options. And so I'll just note a couple here of the different uh, groups that we've talked to and that we think could be viable pathways for us to be able to achieve our goals. So I'm gonna chat a few links in here. Um, the first one that I'll mention is Climeworks. Climeworks is a direct air capture 
project. They, um, they have already achieved success in being able to do this. They have proven the technology behind it. It is a viable method to draw down and store CO2. Second is carbon engineering. They also have been able to prove their technology and that is another method for doing direct drawdown and being able to store uh, CO2 on long timelines. Mechanical trees is a project from Klaus Lochner, who is one of the, or just kind of the guy behind direct air capture. And these are not yet proven or tested, but they are very close to being able to go towards widespread adaptation. Project Vesta is a um, project that's lower energy and uses natural cycles to be able to store more CO2 and works with oceans and beaches. And then finally, XPRIZE um, has a $100 million uh, carbon negative challenge, and we have invited them to invite their winning teams to pilot their projects at Fly Ranch. And so as we move forward, we will continue to have conversations with different groups. We hope to be able to have a portfolio of different projects that we can used to be able to get to um, the level of CO2 drawdown that we need to be able to get to. And so we wanna be able to do that for our events, on our properties, for our year round operations. And so this is really a big shift in what we're doing. Um, but the, uh, the thing that will guide us and the framework that will guide us is our emissions inventory. And because in order to know how much we wanna draw down, we need to know how much we're emitting. And uh, that will set up our next speaker uh, Marnie Benson, who has been working on a uh, emissions inventory that is robust. Um, Marnie is our Director of Government Affairs and has been with Burning Man for a while in different roles. She also is previously the Deputy Director of BlackRock Solar, now BlackRock Labs, um, has expertise and degrees in different en environmental disciplines and is has a lovely picture of Fly Ranch in her background there. Um, so I will turn it over to Marnie uh, to talk a little about the work that she has been doing with the team on our emissions inventory. Thanks, Matt. And hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to present the preliminary results of our Black Rock City 2019 emissions inventory. This work is foundational in our efforts to understand and reduce our carbon footprint. And it was challenging. I represent a small group of talented people working on this project since last year. Uh, Jesse Gibson, Ryan Wartina, and David Shearer, and a larger group of Burning Man Project staff and volunteers who contributed to this work. This is the first time we're sharing this information. We plan to publish our methodology and final results soon, but for today, here's a preview. Um, first, what did we measure? Uh, we measured emissions from air travel for everyone flying at any point of their journey to and from Black Rock City, including flights from overseas, domestic flights, Burner Express Air, and scenic flights over Black Rock City. We measured emissions from vehicle travel to and from the event, including in the continental US and internationally, driving to the airport and driving to BRC and back again. We included Burner Express bus, our infrastructure contractors, and our staff. We measured fuel consumption and burning on site from vehicles, generators, art burns, burn barrels and platforms and flame effects, and emissions from wood and art burning. Nearly 80,000 burners coming from a remarkable number of cities around the world. Let's see if you can guess how many. I'll give you four seconds to put your answer in the chat. How many cities do burners come from around the world? Four, three, two, one. Let's see what you've got. The answer is 5,562. We analyzed uh, many different data sets and our model contained close to 80,000 rows. It was complex. A lot of time was spent developing and documenting the methodology and assumptions. Um, we spent a lot of time cleaning and correcting the data sets and scrubbing any personal information to ensure privacy. And a lot of time was spent evaluating the data that we had and what was missing. We analyzed all this data, and I can tell you that the years of effort put in by our different departments to collect and organize information, uh, ticketing, census, placement, DMV, petrol, art, DPW, Burner Express, and others made this work possible. What didn't we measure? Um, this question, we, we 
grappled with this for, for quite a long time. We had to make some tough choices based on the project timeline. Um, and these are our system boundaries. So what we didn't include is Burning Man projects, year round nonprofit programs and networks uh, outside of Black Rock City. Uh, we didn't include procurement and supply chains. And we didn't uh, evaluate other greenhouse gases like water vapor, methane, ground level ozone, nitrous oxide, and CFCs. We hope that this work will be done in our future iterations of the BRC emissions inventory. One more query for you. Uh, given the system boundaries I've just described and all that you know about Black Rock City, um, I'd like to ask you, what do you think our total emissions were? Get ready to put your guesses in the chat. Uh, we used metric tons, so I invite you to do the same. I know four seconds isn't nearly enough, but that's all you have. <laughs> uh, ready? Four, three, two, one. I might give you a little bit extra time. Um, so I know you all want to hear results. Um, so drum roll, please. That worked. Um, okay, these are all estimates and preliminary. We're finalizing our calculations now and we'll talk more about error and our methodology when we publish our final results. So let's start with air travel. 23,915 people flew in planes on their journey to and from to or from Black Rock City. That included people flying all the way to Black Rock City and people flying to a city near Black Rock City, oftentimes Reno or San Francisco, for example, where they transferred to a vehicle and drove the rest of the way. Most folks flying all the way to Black Rock City used Werner Express Air as the last leg of their arrival or the first leg of their departure, but some used private aircraft. You can see how this gets complicated quickly. Our uh, rock star volunteer, Jesse Gibson, literally created a model from scratch and devised methods to estimate the most likely paths people traveled from the home city listed on their ticket purchase and from data reported by thousands of burners in our annual census. The total number of air miles traveled by burners in 2019 was approximately 130.5 million. That's equivalent to 5,240 trips around the Earth's equator or 546 trips to the moon. We estimated CO2 emissions from air travel to be about 22,300 metric tons. Now let's look at land travel. First, we estimated the total miles traveled by people on their journeys to and from Black Rock City, including participants, staff, Burner Express bus, and Burning Man event production contractors and OSS providers. Think porta potties, ice deliveries, dust abatement, water trucks. Then we adjusted that number of miles by the vehicle occupancy rate we know from years of data tracking. We, we uh, took vehicle types as reported in our census data and created a weighted average MPG. And by vehicle types, um, I mean, was it a passenger vehicle or a fully loaded flatbed truck? Uh, was it an RV or an EV? We took all this into consideration. Finally, we applied an emissions factor of 0 0.00878 pounds of CO2 per gallon of fuel burned. So here's what we found. Burners traveled approximately 49 million miles by land, but that's gross miles traveled as if each individual drove alone, which we know they didn't. So adjusting for carpooling and Burner Express bus, we tallied a total of 23 million vehicle miles. This travel contributed about 26,000 metric tons of CO2 to this inventory. Do note that far fewer people flew than drove, yet their total emissions are quite close. Uh, so now let's see what we found on the playa. We measured CO2 emissions from all the major sources on site in Black Rock City, uh, starting with camps and campers who used about 300,000 gallons of fuel in their generators and propane tanks, emitting about 2,500 metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. That is 4.6% of all BRC emissions and 48.5% of on playa emissions. And then with mutant vehicles, we found that they burned approximately 21,000 gallons of fuel for driving and released 181.6 metric tons of CO2. 
And flame effects from mutant vehicles burned an estimated 84 hundred gallons of propane and generated about 48 uh, metric tons. Um, we also looked at art burns, and I know that you'll be curious to know uh, the results, especially for the man and the temple. Uh, the man and man pavilion emitted about 77 metric tons of CO2 and the temple about 41. All the other art burns combined totaled about 116 metric tons of CO2. Art projects used uh, an additional 9,600 gallons of fuel for logistics, equating to about 68 metric tons of CO2. And the last pieces of on-site activities that we looked at were burn barrels and burn platforms, uh, which emitted about 150 metric tons, and um, the activities of our event production contractors and OSS providers. Uh, about 39,000 gallons of fuel on site. So I've got a few metrics to put these results in perspective, and then I'll close it out. The grand total for travel and on site activity for Black Rock City 2019 is an estimated 54,241 metric tons of CO2. With a population numbering near 80,000, the carbon footprint of an average burner was about 1,500 pounds of CO2. Uh, if you were uh, following along with the numbers, about 91% of Black Rock City's total come from travel and about 9% come from on playa activities. The man accounts for 0.1% of Black Rock City's total emissions and the temple 0.075%. We haven't compared our results to other special events, but we took a look at cities and found that BRC travel related emissions on a per burner per day basis is about five times the average default city daily per capita because of our short stay and because we're moving a full city, not just ourselves. But our on playa related emissions on a per burner per day basis is about a third of the average default city daily per capita because we walk, bike, and don't have industry. Most of our on playa emissions are from burning fuels. If renewables were used, we could eliminate these emissions and be 1 30th of the average city daily per capita. You can likely guess the country responsible for the greatest amount of travel related CO2. It's the US as burners originate, uh, most burners originate from cities in the US. About 67,000 people from Black Rock City start their travel within the US, contributing about 29,000 metric tons of CO2. Uh, major, one last stat and then I'll close it out. Major cities between uh, uh, emit about 88 to 20 million metric tons per year in CO2 emissions. And globally, we're putting up about 50,000 million metric tons of CO2 annually. Um, Black Rock City is one one millionth of the global, global transmissions emissions. So let's reduce that. Uh, we have lots of great graphs and charts to share in our write-up, and you can look for that soon. Our future work uh, will continue and um, I just wanna say the best and juiciest part is that with Burning Man's commitment to environmental sustainability comes an invitation to you, an invitation to engage with us. We've opened the doors through green theme camps, hives, special and regional events, and calls like this one for you to co-create solutions with us. We're excited to use this emissions inventory as a baseline and to continue our path forward with you. And with that, I'll hand it back over to ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, Marnie. That's quite the Herculean effort to track all of that data. And I can't imagine the uh, amount of stress you had to go through. <laughs> awesome. Well, as Marnie said, you know, this is really an invitation for our community to participate and collaborate with us. One of the ways that you can participate is a new social learning platform we've created called Burning Man Hive. Uh, you know, Black Rock City is a place that teaches us so many skills and lessons. And there are so many people working on sustainability uh, in their own silos. And so we recognize that one of the things that we can do to support our community and these goals is to connect our community together and to allow people to collaborate with one another, share their ideas, and get feedback with one another. So Burning Man Hive, you can find it at hive.burningman.org. And it's uh, a place where you can host courses, you can create groups, uh, kind of like a, a Facebook, but a little bit more centered around social learning. Right? So you can take courses as a group, 
Uh, and within Burning Man Hive, we created a, a space called Sustainability Lab. Now within Sustainability Lab, uh, there are different areas where you can share your ideas, introduce yourself, find others to collaborate with. So that's one of the spaces where you can find uh, you know, feedback and uh, learn from other people as well. All right, and with that, I'd like to pass the mic over to our cultural founder, Will Roger, for some closing words. Wow, that was uh, truly inspiring. It's an honor for me to take part in this noble initiative. Thank you, and sincere admiration to all of you who are initiating new ways and processes to live sustainably, renewably, and regeneratively. The Burning Man Project and the Burning Man community is creating a blueprint that can inform other organizations towards the path for humans to live in ecological harmony again. The time has come for all of us to reconsider how we live on this planet Earth, our home, the source of all life. There's an urgency. We are in the epic of the sixth great extinction. What real changes we make today will determine the course of our future on this planet. The Burning Man Project Sustainability Initiative is a real step in the right direction towards ensuring that our habitat remains safe for life as we know it. Right now, this initiative is the most important thing that we can do together. The Burning Man community continues to be inspiring in its unbridled creativity toward problem solving. Thank you to all of you for your participation in the Burning Man Project Environmental Sustainability Initiative. Awesome, thank you for that, Will Roger. And uh, now we'll be wrapping up the call, just a few final words here. If you would like to let us know how you would like to contribute or share your ideas with us, we have a sustainability contributors form that we'll post here in the, in the chat. Uh, what this also allows is for us to create a database of people who want to contribute. And so as we are exploring new projects and new ideas, we can reach out to people. And um, so make sure you put in things that you're working on or where your expertise lies in into that form. And there's also an option to opt into our newsletter. Uh, so that way you can uh, get any updates from us, any new projects we're working on. And we would love to spotlight some of the projects that you are working on in your own communities or regional events. Lastly, if you want more of a direct connection with us, you can email us at sustainability at burningman.org. The last thing I'll mention is, <clears throat> is something we can do right now, every single one of us, and that is that we can make climate action a priority. And so we hope that you feel inspired by this call and that you feel activated to participate with us and your communities. Thank you all for being here, and we hope you have a great weekend.